Thank you, Adrian. And uh, there was a very interesting review of IUGA, which I attended also. Um, I haven't got any, uh, anything to disclose, except for perhaps uh, my longevity in the, in the ICS, because I attended the second meeting in Paris in 1974, um, and have been fairly frequently attending since then. Uh, so the, this session is, uh, this particular bit of the session is on how ICS has changed since its inception. Uh, and it would be wrong if it hadn't changed, and it's changed in a number of ways, and we obviously can't go over all of those changes, but uh, we wanted to look, look particularly at the uh, progress with um, nomenclature and steering committee on standardization and how far that's gone with developing guidelines and also the educational changes. But uh, my task is to deal with the, the problem of um, uh, financial disclosure. But before doing that, this is the first meeting in Exeter. There were only 70 attendees, uh, and amongst these uh, uh, are two people who've died, but the, the man here in the... Sorry, is this showing up? Yeah. Uh, this is the man who started ICS off in Exeter. He was a surgeon there called Peter Caldwell. And this guy in the chair is a paraplegic doctor called Alain Rossier from Geneva and may be known to some of the older um, attendees. Um, so what were the features of the ICS when it started? And I suggest the main thing was the communication, because people were using words which meant different things to different people, and trying to get that correct was the reason why the uh, standardization committee started under the tutelage of Teg Howald. Uh, we also still have a problem with language uh, in ICS. Those of us who've got English as our first language are very grateful to those for whom it isn't their first language and who maybe have much more difficulty in communicating and it's up to us to encourage uh, those who aren't, don't find English easy. And the standardization committee has carried on meeting and regularly producing uh, um, its reports. The second aspect is that it's multidisciplinary. To start with, ICS had mainly urologists. There were 33 urologists out of 70. There were six uh, gynecologists, uh, nine physicists, one spinal injury person, as you saw. There were nine people from industry and two from the Ministry of Health in England, which was encouraging, I guess. There weren't any nurses and physiotherapists, and that's been a great change since they came and have been very productive ever since they've been in ICS. Thirdly, it is an international society going by its name, um, but to start with, there were only five nations representative, re represented there. There was US and UK, Denmark, um, uh, the Netherlands, and France. Perhaps the main feature of the original ICS was that it was to be fun, and they were fun meetings. They were vigorous and, and well argued, but they were fun. And I think ICS is still that way. Long may it continue. So some of the changes which have happened in ICS is that its size has increased enormously. From the 70, I think we were around about 1,700 this meeting. Is that right, Adrian? Uh, and that is a huge increase, and you might gauge success by size of meetings. Um, it has some downsides, because when it's a meeting is small, there's more opportunity for interchange and so on. But essentially, it's been much better because of its size. Governance, initially, we had only three people. There was um, uh, two in, in Edgar Glasgow and, uh, and um, one in Nottingham, the treasurer. Eric Glenn was the general secretary, and David Rowan assisted him in Glasgow. There were no uh, unit secretaries involved, uh, sorry, no secretaries of the organisation involved, and all the work was done by the NHS secretaries. One can't do that these days. And now we've got a, a, a larger, and there are many more uh, inputs from the staff and the ICS office, and that's been a huge benefit. The other change I'd like to just draw attention to is that when it started off, it was a research-based society, and it, now it's grown to include education, education both of the people who come with the state-of-the-art lectures and the reviews, 
and education seminars in developing countries to spread information about uh, clinical aspects to those countries. And it is also spread to expand its horizons to look at professional development. Traditionally, that has been the role of the specialist colleges, um, but ICS has taken on a role in uh, assisting people in the techniques of the specialty. And thirdly, the part I wanted to carry on and discuss a little further was financial disclosure, which didn't used to happen. But over the last 20 to 30 years, it's been increasingly uh, important. Now, financial disclosures are, of course, a result of collaboration with industry, without which we can't really do very much. And uh, Emmanuel, you mentioned the contributions that the industry had had in the IUGA meeting. We are exactly the same here. Uh, we, we need industry for the meetings, but also the research aspects of uh, our members uh, need industry. And that's been good for patients, by and large. We mustn't uh, get too negative about these uh, industry payments that have come because they have got a very strong positive side. We need each other to progress. But a, a declaration of that financial interest is important. And it's been legislated for in the USA under this Physician Sunshine Act, similar act in UK, I understand now, that we have to be transparent. The general public can have access to this. And equally, the, the industry people have to make a declaration of who they're paid and that may or may not be uh, of, of benefit to the general public, but it is there. It has to happen. Now, conflict of interest is not the same as financial disclosure, of course. And a conflict only occurs if the primary interest here, which is looking after the, the welfare of patients and the research and the education, the secondary interests uh, are of financial gain to both the person or their professional advancement or personal achievement. Now, there are some people whose job depends on them uh, publishing work, and there's a bit of pressure there because they don't get promoted if they haven't achieved that. And, but the conflict arises if the primary interests are superseded or neglected in, in uh, pursuit of the secondary. So not all money that changes hands is negative. That's the bottom line, but we do have to be careful about it. The real reason for, for declaring money uh, interests and, and uh, financial disclosure is to avoid biased reporting. And there are many areas in which that bias is potentially there. There's clearly research misconduct, and incredibly this is still happening from time to time where the research methodology is inaccurate, where protocols are changed midstream, and then the results are uh, published as if they were uh, genuine right from the start. An example of that was the paroxetine study, where uh, it was considered safe to give this drug to youth with depression. But it was because of a protocol change, and when it was reanalyzed, uh, it was not uh, proven. So it's still happening, and this is only just a few years ago. The rewards from industry uh, I've discussed. The fee-per-service basis is a potential source of bias. If there's money in it for the surgeon or physician or the physiotherapist or anyone else, then that can colour the advice given or the message received through body language. Uh, one can sort of steer someone in. And that's something to be careful of, I think. But finally, I'd like to ask the question, is bias inescapable? We are all the product of what we've read, what we've heard, the people we've met and had discussions about. And all of these things will potentially alter our views and, and opinions. So I, I suspect that it is not possible to be completely without bias. And the more dogmatic a person is, the more likely it is that, that there's a bias. That's the only thing you can be dogmatic about, Mr Chairman. So declarations. When examined, they are often incomplete. And there's a recent study from, from Denmark looking here at 318 non-industry physicians. 
and they looked at the literature and then did the, the study to find out who was reporting and who wasn't. And as you can see, there were 40 undisclosed conflicts of interest relating to a sponsor, and 79 had undisclosed conflicts of interest when competing with competing companies. Now, I've reported this as Rose Musson has said, but I've used the word conflict of interest, but that should mean financial uh, exchange, because there may not have been a conflict here as defined in the previous slide. Does declaration have a half-life? If you've had a, a declaration of an interest two years ago, then uh, does that fall off the map? Uh, if it's still current, obviously it's still there. But do you actually ever lose that potential conflict? And I suspect there's a, a possibility that might not always happen. Um, the current regulations or recommendations are that it should be within the last two years that you make these conflicts of interest, uh, these declarations. There's sometimes you hear a person saying, uh, I have no conflict of interest in relation to this study. Is that a, a, a thing that the person himself or herself can say? Can they be the ones who say that's not relevant? Or should it be up to the audience to detect that? It's just a question. It's, uh, there are issues around this. I think the ICS is taking the, the attitude that uh, it's probable that discussants should declare their, their uh, interest as well. Because there could be someone who's involved in a company who gets up to ask a question and it's a biased question. And what would happen if none of the money that's given for the particular declaration goes into the, the uh, health professional's pocket? Does that make a difference? Should that be a... Uh, avoided as a conflict or a potential conflict. So having had a declaration, what does it mean? The Sunshine Act uh, demands transparency, and that's a good thing. But it can be a, a perverse incentive here that it can be regarded by those hearing about it as a sign of honesty or expertise, perhaps. Uh, is it a matter of pride and recognition that here I've got all this list of companies that have contributed to me, so I must be good. They must recognise I'm good, otherwise it wouldn't happen. And does it enhance the status of the individual? I haven't got any answers to these questions, but they are really important. This, we, we don't get too critical about financial interests without at least thinking about these things. To make a declaration doesn't mean there's a bias. Because you can have a financial interest, of course, without it affecting your judgment or your opinion, and equally the other way around. You can have no you know, financial interest but still be biased in the reporting. Does it mitigate against bias? Well, there, there have been several papers showing that um, it doesn't. And Wilson draws attention to this. He's a, a Brit that works in Canada, I understand, at the moment. Um, Julian, you may know him. But he, he has written in the Royal Society of Medicine saying that um, two, uh, two examples. One is that uh, in medicine, there's no evidence that it does, that making the declaration reduces the bias. And the other area which he mentioned was in the law. Now, the Wall Street remember, had all that trouble with uh, internal conflicts of interest. Uh, they still had a Sunshine Act type thing that they had to declare a thing, but it didn't stop it happening. So just making a declaration doesn't necessarily do what you would hope. So how should you and I respond to this, to this list of declarations? Well, often it goes so fast, we don't even have time to read it, like the film scripts, the film credits at the end of a film. Um, and when it is there, we haven't time to focus on, well, could that possibly be interfering with the uh, bias? So we have the opportunity to reject what we hear, ignore it, don't believe it, or walk out. Those are not particularly yeah, good options. So we've got to somehow make a judgment. So we listen and read with trust and respect, just as if we didn't know about them having a declaration. In other words, it makes no difference. We should still be dissecting it out with uh, integrity? Should we add scepticism if someone's made a declaration? 
And I just question the uh, ICS stated opinion about this, and that is that we see the, the um, list of disclosures uh, so that we can make an informed judgment. But it's not particularly easy, and people might want to comment on that. So what can we do? We need to continue with disclosing. I'm sure we need to be part of that uh, transparency. The publication of uh, results is not just what you see in the paper. It needs to be careful that the methodology is correct. Uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria are sometimes unreasonable when it comes to thinking about what you do with your patient in the clinic because there have been so many exclusions and inclusions in order to make it pure that it doesn't, it's not relevant exactly to your practice necessarily. Now, Richard Turner Warwick, uh, the mentor of many of us here at the ICS in Dioga, uh, said that in making any statement, we need to keep the facts, the observed facts, separate from the reasons why we think it's worked that way. So you keep the facts in one hand and the concept in the other, but don't shuffle the cards. Don't think that because it's a concept the way I think it's working, that that's a fact. And I suppose the, most, the area that's most likely to uh, result in bias is the discussion of the results. So you may have the facts in your results, but how you relate that to other literature is, is a, a possible place where bias can happen. And finally, uh, we need to acknowledge that we all have some biases. And um, so that's a, a way of challenging the financial disclosures that we all do. We have to keep on doing it, but we need some sort of guidance, I suspect, on how to deal with it. Thank you.